Welcome to this week's edition of the St. Paul Podcast. I'm Peter Marty, Senior Pastor of St. Paul Lutheran Church, located in the heart of Davenport, Iowa. Right here each week, you can hear a message to inspire your walk with God and hear beautiful music to fill your life. Let this podcast be your occasion to contemplate some of the deepest things in life, just as I hope it helps faith come alive for you. This is Peter Pettit, teaching pastor at St. Paul, and our scripture reading is in one of the letters of St. Paul, the apostle. In writing to the Corinthians, Paul uses the image of the body to talk about the church. As we read his language about the body, what we know about the church can also help us think about our own bodies, and who we are individually and collectively as the body of Christ. From Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 12. Just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in the one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. Indeed, the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot would say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear would say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as God chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many members, 
and yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. If one member suffers, all suffer together with it. If one member is honored, all rejoice together with it. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. Some of you may have noticed this week, as I did, that a giant of the fashion industry died early in the week at age 73. Andre Leon Talley was a giant in the fashion industry in his influence. He spent 30 years as an editor at Vogue magazine. He was a regular sitting in the front row right by the runways of New York and Paris and Milan during Fashion Week. He was the annual commentator on the couture that walked across the red carpet at the Met Gala in New York City every year. He was a giant in his influence. Andre Leon Talley was also a giant in his presence in the room. He stood six feet six inches tall and tipped the scales at well over 300 pounds. Tally was a very large man. Somewhere in his career, he had traveled to Marrakesh and discovered that the day-to-day -day clothing of North African black men in Marrakesh, that desert climate in uh, North Africa were these long caftans, flowing robes with loose fabric billowing around the body. And so Tally adopted the caftan and these elaborate capes that he would have designed for himself as his own style. And in an interview that I heard from several years ago that was done with Tally, the interviewer which interview was replayed this week, and the interviewer had asked him rather tentatively, I would say, whether he thought perhaps his choice of style with these flowing caftans and capes had anything to do with his weight, with his size. Well, Tally's voice was as big as he was, and his laugh was huge, and he burst out in this huge laughed and said, absolutely, absolutely it had something to do with it. Now, fashion is about statement often, and I wondered, with that bold absolutely and his bold designs that he wore, was Tally making a statement of affirmation? Here I am, this is who I am, what you see is what you get, take it or leave it? Or might all of this flowing cloth and drapery have really been trying to hide something, to hide all of that mass and girth and height? I will never know. We will never know what Andrew Leon Talley thought particularly about his body, but it gave me to think about my own body and how I think of it, how I relate to it. And I suspect that like many people, I suspect many people like I have a sense of ambivalence about our bodies. On the one hand, if you think about it, our body, my body, is the most private aspect of myself. Nobody else in the world, no one knows what it is to live in my body. With its tweaks and its twinges and the way that it affects and shapes everything that I do in life, every minute of the day and night. It's deeply personal and private. And at the same time, my body 
is the most public element of myself. Far more people, thousands of people, over the course of my lifetime, I don't know, maybe tens of thousands of people will see my body. They might comment on my body. Who knows what they'll think about my body? Because many, many, many more people will see my body as the representation of myself far more than will ever say hello, have a conversation, know anything about my personality. It is in many ways the most public aspect of ourselves. And as the visual media of the 20th and 21st century have taken hold in our society, television and film and social media and the like, our bodies, these public things that are out there for everyone to see, have of course become commercialized. There's a whole commercial society that exploits the visibility of our bodies. Think about the industries that have grown up around the look of your body. Fitness, diet, cosmetics, beauty, clothing, hair care. And the supplies that you can purchase or the services that you can avail yourself of or the magazines, oh my goodness, the magazines and magazines that show off and discuss the body. And much of the language of this is about love. Do you love yourself enough to have softer skin? Wouldn't you find more love if your clothing had this label on it? Isn't there something about love that we can provide you through your diet or your fitness or your hair care? The language is love, but of course the message is you need to fix something. You need to improve something. Have you judged the last time you looked in a mirror exactly what you're seeing? Is it perfect yet? And on the commercial side, the end of that is, of course, buy our products, buy our services, buy our magazines. But on the personal, individual side of that, the end rather is that we can never be satisfied. Now, I will grant that it is hard to be satisfied with one's body. All the way through life, there are pitfalls that we trip over. When we're young, will I ever grow into these ears or out of these feet? What will my body be when I grow up? I don't know. In our prime of life, can I take enough time to care for my body? Can I really give attention to the way that I want my body to be and to give it what it needs? And as I grow older, oh, how many things I realize my body just won't do anymore no matter how I coax it, train it, feed it, or anything else. There are always reasons for discontent, for embarrassment, for frustration about our bodies. And yet, and yet, this body is what God created. When God reached down into the earth and drew out that red clay and fashioned it into an atom and breathed life into it. This body is what God formed. And this body, this kind of body, is what the Word of God became, flesh. When the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and all that Jesus did, Jesus did in his body. The Bible specifically says Jesus ate, he drank, he spit, he slept, he bled, he sweated blood, he felt gut wrenching emotion. He wept. He reached out to touch in deep compassion. 
He screamed in agony. He barked like a drill instructor. All of what Jesus did, he did in his body. And with all of that, we can assume he did much more. All that we do in our bodies, all that our bodies can do, and they can be amazing. A number of years ago, I sat with a cardiologist in his office and looked at the echocardiogram that had been done on my heart. And it was absolutely phenomenal. There it was, doing its thing. 70, 80 times a minute, just doing its thing. And it didn't matter whether I thought about it. Most of the time, I don't. Most of the time, we don't. We don't think about our hearts. And if we tell them to slow down, they don't. And if I say, speed up, it usually doesn't. It just keeps doing its thing day after day, year after year. Thank God. They can be amazing. I, honestly, I, if you remember the videos of worship a year ago and watching what Chris Nelson's body can do sitting on that organ bench, it is amazing. Well, and then, of course, there are the times when our bodies do, oh, amazing things, really amazing things, things we wish they wouldn't do at all. But even when they break down, even when they come with something other than the familiar parts list, even when they don't fit together quite right, even when they wear out sooner than we want or expect, still, this is the same kind of body in which Jesus lived among us. Genesis 1, the creation story, records that God said, let us make humanity in our image. In the image of God, God created them. And in the Talmud, a discussion of that phrase, in our image, points out that when people strike an image into coins, every coin comes out with the same image. Think of George Washington on the quarter or... Uh, Roosevelt on the dime, or the Lincoln, is it a Lincoln penny? Um, everyone exactly the same. But when God strikes God's image into flesh, every one comes out unique, different from every other one. And yet all are in the image of God, just as we are. And perhaps it takes all of us together to be the image of God. Paul moves in that direction in this letter to the Corinthians in chapter 12 when he talks about the body of Christ now, the body of Christ that is the people of God on earth. And there was a lot going on in Corinth. He names Jews and Gentiles, slaves and free, but oh my goodness, how many more there were. And they did not all think that all of the others belonged. They were not convinced that everyone ought to be a part of this body of Christ that was going on in Corinth. And Paul said, look for the gift. Look for the gift in that other part of of the body. This is about gifts of the Spirit, and there are many different gifts of the Spirit, so look for the gift in the other. And if it turns out to be different from yours, don't cut it off. Work it in. Look for its place in the body. Find where that giftedness serves and is part of and strengthens the body. After all, a body with many, sometimes contrary, parts was good for Jesus in his lifetime and also is good for the body of Christ now, this new life, the body of Christ that is the community. And no one body can be the whole. No body can be 
perfect in that way and no body can be perfected in that way. Our curious, complicated, cantankerous bodies, we really can love them and love them enough to find the gifts in them. Because you are, in Paul's words, the body of Christ and individually members of it. Cherished, gifted in spirit, integral, necessary members of the body of Christ. Amen. Please join me in the words our Lord taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. 
And now may you go in your glorious and gifted body, finding those with other gifts and working them into this one body in which we share. Go now in love and peace to serve the Lord. Amen. I hope you've enjoyed this podcast, and thanks for your support of the ministries of St. Paul Lutheran Church. Our commitment to projects that lend hope to other people stretches across the country and around the world. We hope that in a good way, you feel a part of that reach. Tune in next Thursday for another edition of the St. Paul Podcast.